Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to see you here and thank you for coming. And uh, if uh, any of you uh, can hear better or see better, if you come closer, why, I'd love to have you. But if you're happy where you are, why, then I'll be happy too. <coughs> I think the uh, subject, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the uh, subject of our morning's uh, discussion will be the well-tempered clavier of John Sebastian Bach. Uh, you will uh, be interested to have me pause for a minute or take up time to just discuss the title. It's clavier, don't say clavichord. Oh dear, well-tempered. Now, uh, <coughs> many people have said clavichord, and they still continue to say it carelessly. The trouble is that clavichord is not exactly wrong. It's just incomplete. <coughs> the uh, work was written for either a, either a clavichord, probably was rarely played on a clavichord, but possibly a clavichord, or very probably a harpsichord. And then uh, later on in uh, Bach's life, why the piano began to come in, Bach played it once, possibly twice in his life. And uh, there's absolutely no reason to think that uh, it is unsuitable to the pianoforte. The German word clavier <coughs> simply means any kind of a keyboard, a keyboard instrument. So it's the well-tempered keyboard instrument, not clavichord. The reason it was called clavichord was that a tradition sprang up, all possibly traceable to uh, some of one of Bach's sons. Tradition sprang up that the clavichord was Bach's favorite. But uh, I think that's been pretty well, uh, pretty well exploded nowadays. Uh, no doubt Bach played the clavichord and with pleasure once in a while but for the most part, his chief domestic instrument, domestic keyboard at any rate, was the harpsichord. Uh, Well-tempered. Now, uh, uh, I imagine you uh, know what this means, but perhaps some of you are not absolutely positive on the subject. It uh, means that Bach uh, <coughs> expressed his support of the tempered tuning of the keyboard instruments. Uh, a keyboard instrument is an instrument where every tone has a fixed pitch. It's not like a violin where you can shift a little bit and play a little higher or a little lower. You just have to take what the tuner has given you or what you have tuned it for. Now, <coughs> somewhere in our key scheme there is a fundamental discrepancy. If you uh, take perfect fifths from the bottom up, go on up the fifths, you finally will reach a tone which is almost, but not quite, in tune with the, with the tone from which you started. It's almost one of the octaves of the basic tone. Somewhere in our tonal system there is this discrepancy. And uh, <coughs> of course it uh, doesn't mean much to violin players because they just play every interval in tune where they find it. It doesn't matter if that high C that they get uh, is not an absolute octave with the low C. They simply play it in tune where they find it. On the other hand, on a keyboard, you have to make a, an absolute tuning. Well, the tempered tuning was an attempt to uh, <coughs> distribute this discrepancy throughout the octave. Uh, if they didn't, if they tried to tune absolutely in perfect tune, why certain keys were impractical. It was uh, not possible to play in certain keys because it would come out out of tune. Uh, you find that the well-tempered clavier is not the only series of pieces <coughs> that Bach arranged in a key scheme. You'll find that the inventions, the two and three part inventions, also go in a key scheme. 
but there are only there are 24 preludes and fugues but there are only 15 inventions in each set he has to leave out the keys which would be intolerably out of tune on a on a keyboard that was not well tempered so you find in the inventions you have c major c minor <coughs> d major d minor that's fine e flat major but not e flat minor too many flats could not be could not be played in tune uh, e major e minor f major f minor but no f sharp major no f sharp minor g major g minor no a flat major no g sharp minor a major a minor b flat major no b major so you uh, you have 10 well let me see nine keys left out in the inventions but every key is represented in the well-tempered clavier <coughs> Oh yes, well, I didn't uh, describe the, the well-tempered clavier, really. Forgot to mention, it is, of course, a series of preludes and fugues, each one in a different and successive major and minor key. And played in these 12 major and 12 minor keys, it could only be played on an instrument which had the equal temperament, which was the tempered tuning. And so that's why he called it the well-tempered clavier. Uh, Bach did not invent the system of uh, tempered tuning. He did not invent it. It had existed for some generations before his time. He simply expressed his support <coughs> of this scheme. There were cert certain people who did not believe in it, but Bach did. And uh, well, Today, even, there are people who complain slightly of the tempered tuning. You'll find violinists having to play with a piano will uh, sometimes uh, become a little irritated because to them the piano is out of tune. But uh, Bach's hearing was pretty good. No one has ever complained about uh, his hearing. And he was willing to take this little discrepancy for the sake of the general convenience. You'll find uh, <coughs> the, uh, one of the most uh, palpable examples of uh, Bach's purpose comes in the uh, prelude in E-flat minor, in first book of the Well-Tempered, prelude in E-flat minor, which is then followed by a fugue in D-sharp minor. Now, according to the mean tone, tuning, according to the old-fashioned tuning, E-flat and D-sharp are not the same. In, and indeed, they are not really. But according in the well, in the tempered tuning, E-flat and D-sharp are the same. And he has the prelude in E-flat and the fugue in D-sharp. That is, he has it in his original writing. Sometimes the editions put them both in the same key. The printed editions do. Uh. I have here a facsimile of the Bach's own handwriting of the well-tempered clavier, and uh, you're welcome to uh, have a look at it uh, afterward. Just want to... Yes, here you are. Prelude is in six flats, and the fugue is in six sharps in Bach's own handwriting. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how much, uh, how, how much you people know or how much your minds need refreshing. I presume you all know what a fugue is, uh, <coughs> or you have some idea of what a fugue is. I uh, would like to uh, perhaps uh, oh, refresh your minds on the subject. I don't want to give you a complete disposition on the nature of a fugue. There are certain terms that are important to remember. As you know, <coughs> the fugue is a polyphonic composition. That is, it's for many voices. The original ideal back of it was singers, a choir of singers. And the voices are named by their, well, they're, they're named vocally, soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. <clears throat> if there are four, if there are three, you say upper, middle, and lower. 
uh, if there are five, it's uh, first and second altos or first and second tenor or something like that. And uh, as you know, a fugue is based on a subject, a, uh, <coughs> a melody or a strain of melody lasting one measure, possibly two measures, in some cases more. And uh, it's a complicated scheme, relatively complicated scheme, a pattern which, uh, however, has many attractions. It appeals to people's sense of logic, unity, and uh, the scheme was followed by composers pretty strictly in general, not absolutely strictly. Uh, one of the most amusing things is to contemplate the very first fugue in Bach's well-tempered clavier, which uh, breaks one of the fundamental rules of the pattern. Uh, <coughs> according to uh, the conventional rule, the, the subject is announced alone by one voice, then imitated in the fifth by another, then the third voice goes back to the same pitch in the octave, as, that is to say, an octave above or below the, the first voice, and the fourth one, an octave above or below the second voice. And the order in which they come in is, <coughs> begins in any voice, first imitation is an adjacent voice. If you begin in the alto, <coughs> the first imitation will be either soprano or tenor. The second imitation will be in a parallel voice. If you begin with the tenor, the second imitation will have to be soprano. If you begin with the alto, the second imitation ought to be the bass. And then, of course, the fourth is the remaining voice that comes in. <coughs> and uh, the subject is adhered to pretty strictly with certain exceptions, which I won't bother to mention. Uh, <coughs> the next uh, notion I would like to recall to you is that of so-called counter-subject. It's called, sometimes called counter-subject, sometimes called uh, thematic counterpoint. Well, I'll put it all down here. Subject. Counter-subject. This counter-subject exists in many fugues, it isn't, does not in all of them. The counter-subject is the first counterpoint, the first melody that is composed to join with the subject at the very beginning. The subject, let us say, starts in the, uh, in the alto, and then the first imitation comes in the interval of the fifth in the soprano, and then what does the alto do while the soprano has the subject? Well, it indulges in a characteristic melody which is called a counter subject and which also is repeated many times in the course of the composition. <coughs> uh, now, uh, is that all there is to a fugue? It would be sort of dull, wouldn't it, if you just had nothing but the subject over and over again? Well, it isn't. The, the subject does contain most of the or almost all of the chief thematic element of the fugue, the subject and counter subject. But uh, the fugue itself is not confined absolutely to statements of the subject or the counter subject. You have places, parts of the fugue where neither the subject nor the counter subject uh, are, are uttered places called episodes, and these are quite important. They constitute an element of variety or of departure. Plural. <coughs> Nevertheless, the episodes are not just, uh, uh, just not uh, done off the cuff. They usually find that the episodes in themselves are derived from the fugue subject, often constitute among the more interesting parts of the fugue. Then, of course, the subject itself is treated to a great many changes. 
I won't say variations because that word might be ambiguous. Very many, uh, well, changes is the word. You have the subject in its original form, then you have it on different scale steps. That is to say, let's, let's take the very first one. <coughs> scale steps within the same within the same key or transposed into another key then you have a device known as shifted rhythm you have in <coughs> one of the few this uncommon device for achieving variety within the subject itself. A very common device is uh, one known as contrary motion, sometimes called inversion. Inversion. Well, I think you're all familiar with this. It's, uh, well, let's see if I give you a good sample of yes. same, only every interval is in the opposite direction from what, what it was in few. Contrary motion or inversion. Uh, another device is known as diminution. Uh, you have the identical notes and rhythms of the fugue subject, only half time, or twice as fast, we'll say. Twice as fast. Uh, then you have the reverse augmentation, where the subject remains the same, only each note is twice as long. You have a subject, for instance, in one of the C minor fugues, which later becomes the Yes. <clears throat> then you have another very interesting device known as stretto. Stretto is uh, an Italian word. It's uh, derived from the Latin. It, stringere in Latin means to squeeze something. And a thing is squeezed past participle, why it is strict. That's all it means. Strict, we have the word constrict and restrict. And stretto is the Italian form. It really just means narrow, narrow. But what's narrow? in music, in an imitation of a, of a fugue subject. Well, what's narrow is the distance between the announcement and the imitation. Normally, you have an announcement here, and then the imitation comes here afterward. But suppose they overlap. The distance between them is narrowed. That is known as a stretto. In other words, you can get this fugue subject to accompany itself, to counterpoint itself. With, with its own material. It's like a garment, a coat that's lined with its own material, that kind of thing. This, of course, is another device. And then one uh, very subtle one, which would be a stretto in contrary motion. In other words, the fugue is right side up, and the imitation is upside down, but they almost come at the same time. They overlap. Now, this is a very neat trick if you can do it. And, uh, also, shall I say, if you can hear it. <laughs> well, 
I think maybe I've uh, said enough about this. Uh, <clears throat> now, you may ask, uh, uh, is that all there is to a fugue? Is it just, uh, is it just that kind of joinery? Are you just playing around with this subject and lining it with itself and imitating it and uh, going on and on? Well, the answer is, of course, no. If that's all you can see in it, I'd say keep away. Uh, like all other patterns and forms of music, the pattern, the logic, which is desirable, but it also serves a, an imaginative purpose, an emotional purpose. Uh, fugues, like all other compositions, uh, express certain moods, certain types of feeling, and if you hear the well-tempered clavier played properly, one of the uh, things that you will notice is the extraordinary variety, the emotional variety that you will find in it. <coughs> At least uh, when I've played it, when I've played all these preludes and fugues, the, the remark that flatters me the most is when people say, oh, I never knew there was so much variety in it. And, uh, if, of course, your mind is all on the, so taken up with the structure that you uh, can't put any expression into it, well, that's just too bad. You're just, uh, you're missing the music for the notes. <coughs> uh, Sebastian Bach composed these preludes and fugues, uh, 24 of them, in the year 1722, when he was, uh, chamber musician to the Prince of Curtin, Leopold of Curtin. And uh, at that time, Bach had nothing to do with any church. He was, uh, he didn't even have a proper organ. His chief interest was chamber music. And that's when he wrote all his concertos for string instruments, all the concertos for keyboard, the Brandenburg concertos, uh, the French suites, and uh, this, these 24 preludes and fugues. 22 years later, after he had uh, spent half a lifetime in Leipzig as the uh, cantor, that is the uh, uh, precentor, I think is the English term, the leader of music in the St. Thomas's Church School in Leipzig. After he was through with that, practically retired from that job, he again sat down and wrote 24 preludes and fugues. And by common consent, they have been called the Well-Tempered Clavier Book Two, Book Two. So there exist actually 48 preludes and fugues. Book One has 24 and Book Two has 24. <coughs> and there are certain differences in style between the books. As you can see, a man writing 22 years later would not be quite the same as, as he had been the first time. Uh, what about the preludes? What's a prelude? Well, a prelude is anything. Anything, literally speaking. It can be a rather lyrical movement. It can be an agile movement just for fingers to play. It, uh, there's absolutely nothing in the, in the way of a pattern that can be predicated of a, of a prelude. I will say this, however, that I have a feeling, I cannot prove this, but I have a feeling that there is some kind of emotional connection, some kind of connection between Bach's preludes and fugues. Somehow I seem to feel, they of course agree in key, they're always in the same key, but I sometimes have the feeling that uh, the prelude and the fugue are two phases of the same mood two phases. It's, uh, there is a certain relationship, a certain relationship of mood between them. Uh, at least I like to play them that way. There isn't any indication. Bach has practically no expression marks in his music. He's written none. But uh, I feel better, I feel more logical if I can make the prelude and the fugue seem like two parts of the same general idea. There are, of course, some preludes and fugues which simply cannot be <coughs> assimilated that way. <coughs> There's the F-sharp minor in book one. Which is 
agile and uh, nimble, and then a very quiet too. Uh, somehow, I can't make too much of a connection there. But there are some where <clears throat> I will force the connection in the way that I play it. Uh, <clears throat> If, uh, if the prelude seems to involve a certain vigorous attack, I will try to make the fugue also have this something of that same vigor. <coughs> well, uh, I think perhaps the best thing I could do now would be to play you a prelude and fugue, or play you a fugue, perhaps, and uh, perhaps illustrate some of these things. I think I'll begin with the... Uh, one, one of the fugues that you're most likely to be familiar with is C minor in book one, that is number two. <coughs> editions later, and uh, Bishop was a very fine scholar from the 19th century. He had uh, available to him all the original manuscripts, or almost all of them, and uh, he's really <coughs> very reliable when it comes to the text itself. You can be pretty sure that he has put down everything that is likely to have, been, have originated with Bach. On the other hand, he pretended to be an interpreter, which is very unfortunate. And so he's put expression marks, all of this, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, one is entitled to disregard. Well, his expression mark here is grazioso e tranquillo. It's cute. It's like that. Well, it sounds all right that way. I wouldn't say it was too queer an idea. Except that I don't think it goes with the prelude. The prelude is rather firm and vigorous, and I like to play this fugue also in a vigorous way. There's another problem. These two notes, uh, these two adjacent notes are quite easy to play, and uh, if you don't look out, they're going to sound like an ornament. Da -da -dum, dum dum da -da -dum, dum dum Which I think is contrary to the spirit of the music. I like to detach them, see. descending scale. says not just yet. Between the announcement of the, of the second voice and the third voice, he has an episode. And the episode goes like this. I'm sorry. Now, how does he make that episode up? Well, he makes it up out of the subject and the counter subject. Scale 
line is somehow related to the scale line of the counter cell. what to do next in a few. What happens? All right, yes, you have the subject, you have an imitation, you have an episode, you have a, a device, a contrary motion or a stretto or something like that, but does it lead to anything? The answer is yes. It does lead to something if it's properly played. Actually, there is, in addition to the structural elements, the simultaneous structural elements, there are also the forward-looking structural elements. The fact is that fugues are all made, Bach's fugues, in what is known as sectional form. What does that mean? Well, the thing goes along, it rolls along evenly, but does come to certain stopping points, stopping points, known as cadences, usually full cadences in, on a tonic chord, but almost always in a different key from the beginning. Cadences. In, I say a different key from the beginning, but a related key. What's a near related key? Well, the near related key is any key with one accidental more or air, or one accidental less than the central key, the key you're talking about. So, if you take A major, that has three sharps. The near related keys are, of course, first its own relative minor, F sharp minor, and then anything that has either two sharps or four sharps. In other words, D major and B minor, 
as well as E major and C sharp minor. You get a little box of six keys, which you can call a kind of tribe, a tribe of keys or a clan of keys, a little family there, which one is the center. Now you'll find practically always in all the Bach fugues that he goes along and then comes to some kind of a stopping point on one of the near-related keys. <laughs> 